Okay, so here is a short video on gel electrophoresis. Now, gel electrophoresis does require some background knowledge, um, particularly on enzymes called restriction enzymes. So if you need a refresher of how restriction enzymes work, I recommend you go back and or pause this video and then find a video, whether it's mine or someone else's, uh, on restriction enzymes. So my I have a video called uh, intro to biotech and restriction enzymes that will explain their job and their role. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and see how this works. So in gel electrophoresis, it does rely on a gel that's kind of the same or similar texture to like jello, right? Um, and so it is going to analyze DNA samples. Now to take DNA samples though, we are actually going to cut them up with an enzyme called a restriction enzyme. So if you think about like a human sample, if you were to take all the DNA from one nucleus in one of my cells, there would be over 6 billion base pairs, right? That DNA in one nucleus stretches 6 feet long in a human. So uh, what we do is we take a DNA sample and we're going to like chop it up with a restriction enzyme. So if you are comparing DNA samples of multiple different people, for example, for example, uh, you would use the same restriction enzyme. So here, this purple little Pac-Man looking thing represents the restriction enzyme. And you can see I cut the DNA into fragments. Now, once the DNA has been like chopped up, um, what we're going to do is we're going to place it into the gel. So here, the DNA sample would be placed into a well, which is like a hole at the top of the uh, gel, which I'll um, show again on the next slide. Now, this gel, though, is placed into a machine or a contraption, I guess, and there are electrodes that run to it. There's a negative side as well as a positive side of this gel electrophoresis um, setup. Now, DNA has a negative charge because of that phosphate group that's part of the nucleotides. So that phosphate group has a negative charge. Uh, so therefore, the overall charge of DNA is negative. So if I were to place this into a gel near a negative electrode, that negative DNA is going to repel from the negative charge. Now, it's also going to not only repel, but then also be attracted to the positive end. So over here, there's a positive electrode at the opposite end of the wells. And so when you um, turn on power to this, these electrodes, and you have a charge happening, the DNA is actually going to then separate. Now, as you can see here, we have the larger fragments near the top. They didn't migrate or travel very far, and the smaller ones went the furthest. Now, part of this is because they are moving through a substrate, like they're moving through, I believe it's a polysaccharide, and so it's kind of like the smaller ones can get through faster is basically what it comes down to. And so when we look at a gel, um, here we have the negative side of the gel uh, is where the wells are located. And then we have our positive side. Now the wells is where the DNA samples are added. So here's a picture of adding or micropipetting DNA into the different wells. Um, and then once you've added DNA samples, then you would turn it on and that's what would cause them to move. But um, because we are separating the DNA based like into fragments, we can use what's called a DNA ladder or like a marker that is made of known sizes. So here when we see like a thousand all the way down to a hundred BP, that BP stands for base pairs. So a base pair is like G pairs with C. So that would be one base pair. This picture here on the right would be five base pairs. So when we look at that DNA ladder, what we see is um, fragments of a thousand base pairs would be the largest, and then the ones of a hundred base pairs would be the smallest. So when we, um, here you have your larger fragments are gonna be near the top, and the smaller fragments will be near the bottom. So when we add a DNA sample, um, basically, you micropipette it into the well, and then the um, electrodes will be turned on, and then those fragments, oops, oops that was fast, the fragments are going to separate out based on size and because of their charge. 
So because DNA is negatively charged, it's going to be repel, or it's going to repel from that negative electrode or that negative side of the gel and move towards the positive side. Now, how fast it's able to move or how far it's able to travel is really based on the size of the fragments. The smaller fragments can travel the fastest. Now, uh, when we look at this gel here, I also want to point out that like the width of the band also indicates how many fragments there are of that size. If we look at sample one, for example, um, let's look like right here between 500 and 400 base pairs, you see a little thin line versus around 300 base pairs is a very thick line. Uh, sample one, the DNA sample number one, would have lots of fragments of approximately 300 base pairs long. So sometimes the like width of the band can also indicate how many fragments of that size. Okay, now what are some reasons we could use gel electrophoresis? One of them is paternity testing, which I think is kind of cool. And so if we have DNA from the mother and we have DNA from the child and we're trying to figure out, well, which of these potential males is the father, uh, what we can do is we can look at that child's DNA and the mom's DNA, their fragments, and realize that a child gets half its DNA from the mother and then half from the father. So the DNA fingerprint, like the pattern of DNA fragments from the child, should be composed of some from the mom and some from the dad. So let's go ahead and check. So the child here has a fragment. Um, let's see, there we go. So that first about, what, 950 base pairs came from the mother. Well, the next one, the mother doesn't have, but father, possible father number two does have a fragment that size. If we look at possible father number one and number three, they, as and the mom, they do not have a fragment that is 900 base pairs. Right here, we can pretty much stop and be like, oh, it's father number two. But of course, we're going to double check and we're going to keep on going just to confirm that father two is the actual father. So if we look at the next child's fragment, we inherited it from father number two, then the next one's from the mother, and so on. So here we can see the child is composed of fragment sizes from both the mom and father number two. So in a paternity case, we would say father two is the father. Now, another interesting way that I've seen gel electrophoresis be used is in genetics and talking about like um, homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So if we talk about um, some alleles, let's say we are looking at a homozygous dominant individual. How many like, if they have two copies of the same allele, you can imagine that that fragment representing dominant A, um, that individual would have two of them, so they would have like one band, right? Because it's two of the exact same allele. Uh, now, if a person was homozygous recessive, would they have that same size fragment? Well, maybe not, like especially if it is a different um, version of the gene because of deletions of sections of a gene possibly. Maybe it's a smaller uh, sequence of DNA than the dominant version. So being homozygous recessive, they would have two copies of the same. So again, you would expect one band. However, if a person is heterozygous, what do you think their um, pattern is going to be? Yeah, if they have one dominant and one recessive, you would expect two bands in their gel. So I don't know, once in a while, I'll come across a problem that uses a gel for alleles, and I thought this would be helpful to kind of see it ahead of time. Now, my last slide to summarize gel electrophoresis is when we look at um, how it works it, and what it's for. So it's a, a tool that's used to separate uh, DNA, RNA, and even proteins um, based on their size and their charge. And you end up getting like a fingerprint of that molecule. Now, what would we use them for? Well, one could be, I didn't talk about, would be for like crime scene analysis. If you have like blood at a crime scene, some of that blood could be from the victim and some of it could be from the suspect. So just like we saw in that paternity case, you could use that to determine um, which suspect is responsible. Oops, sorry. Um, we could also use it to look at evolutionary relatedness. A few years ago, there was a fully preserved, um, like extinct, a uh, baby woolly mammoth uh, discovered, I believe it was in Russia, like in the melting permafrost, there was a frozen baby woolly mammoth that had been frozen for 40,000 years. Well, we have access now to its DNA, and we can compare that to modern elephants to determine evolutionary relatedness. 
How rad is that? And then we could also use it, like I mentioned, for paternity testing. And so uh, that's my short video on gel electrophoresis, and I hope it was helpful for you. Good job.